Hello students, welcome to the EPG Part Shala. I am Professor Richa Tanwar from the Women's Studies Research Center, Kurukshetra University. Today, I am going to talk about the role of the RSMH on women in India from the paper Women in Society in India. The objectives of the module are to make the learner aware of the ideology of the RSMH and its role in the emancipation of women. From the 30s of the 19th century in India and in Punjab, different socio-religious reform societies in three different communities, that is Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims, such as the Brahmo Samaj, the Pratha Samaj, the Ara Samaj, Dev Samaj, the Singh Sabha movement and the Aligarh movement played a remarkable role in influencing the minds of the people through their reforming activities. The period of the later half of the 19th century was an age of definition and redefinition. The leaders of all the movements aspired to record society in the areas of social behavior, custom and structure or control. It was in this context that the women question assumed significance and many of the reformers sought to improve the condition of this deprived section of society. In fact, during the 19th century, most campaigns for the amelioration of women's conditions were based on the liberal premise that it was both wrong and unfair that certain categories of humankind should be subjected to any discrimination. The reformers thus initiated a process of regeneration and revitalization of the cultural norms and social practices. The Arasamaj was a revivalist movement in its character. It took inspiration above all from the indigenous culture. Formally started in Kathiawar on 10th of April 1875 by Swami Dayanand Saraswati, 1824 to 1883 is his lifespan, with the motive to bring the national progress, the great task before the Arasamaj was the problem of social reconstruction. Dayanand Saraswati, the founder of the Ara Samaj, came from Kathiawar, but the Samaj acquired their principal base in northern India, Punjab and parts of western UP. Punjab entered the British colonial fold only by the mid-19th century when the British had already established its identity as imperial rulers. Punjab was also unique in its internal religious history insofar as the contact between the Islamic world and Hindu tradition had resulted not only in more than half of the population being Muslim, but also in the fact that it was here that Sikhism had grown as an independent religion, a quietist movement owing much to Islam, though often persecuted by Muslim rulers with close links to Hinduism while challenging the dominance of the caste system under the Brahmins. The major concerns and the social ideals of the Ara Samaj. The major concerns of Ara Samaj are based on equality of the sexes, absolute justice and fair play between men and women and equal opportunities for all according to their nature, karam and merit. Swami Dayanand's admirable work Satyat Prakash was published in 1875 though a revised and expanded edition appeared in 1884 after his death, expounded his unique doctrine. His motto was back to the Vedas. When Swami Dayanand began his work in the later half of the 19th century, he realized that Hindu society had been on the decline. With other major issues such as spread of education among masses to bring awareness, the Ara Samaj made efforts for the upliftment of women the lower classes, which were of equal status as far as the Shastric position was concerned. When the Arya Samaj was brought into existence, the condition of women was deplorable. They had lost their high position in the family as well as in the society. Women began to maintain parda and depended on their male family members. Early marriage became almost universally prevalent among them and monogamy was replaced by polygamy. Swami Dayanand and his Arya Samaj were no less generous and no less bold in their crusade to remove the condition of women. 
both advocated the complete emancipation of women. They advocated that women should be educated. Like Annie Besant, they believed that the regeneration of India was possible only through the proper education of her women. They advocated that until girls were educated, taught and trained, until they knew the glory of the past and taught the children on their knees what India was and what she might be, until Indian mothers were also worthy of the Indian women of the past, until they became patriots as well as the men and loved the land as well as their husbands, until these things were done in India, India would remain weak. The Samaj believed that proper and equal education should be given to the female and the male population. It believed that if men were educated and women uneducated, or women educated and men uneducated, then the household would be a place of constant warfare between the gods and demons, and there would be no happiness. Dayanand clearly advocated that a Brahmin woman and a Kshatriya woman should learn all sciences, a Vaishya woman should learn commerce and Shudra woman the art of service. Just as men should learn at least grammar, theology and the principles of their profession, similarly women should necessarily learn grammar, theology, medicine, arithmetic and art. Without this much it was not possible to ascertain what was right and what was wrong. What sort of treatment should be offered to the husband and others? How household affairs should be carried on? How food should be prepared by hygienic methods? And how disease should be kept out and happiness secured in the family? After providing complete master plan for an all-round development of the Indian society on modern lines, then in order to accomplish this gigantic task effectively, founded an organization, the Arya Samaj, on 10th April 1875. Anyone, no matter what religion, caste or creed he or she belonged to, could become its member, provided he or she had firm belief in God, in his blessed worlds, the Vedas, and was prepared to accept the following principles. One should be ever ready to accept truth and renounce untruth. Everything should be done according to the dharma, that is, after considering what is truth and what is untruth. The chief objective of the Samaj was to do good to the world by improving physical, spiritual and social conditions of mankind. All ought to be treated with love and justice according to their deserts. Ignorance ought to be dispelled and knowledge diffused. Nobody should remain contented with his personal progress only. One should count the progress of all as one's own. Everyone should consider himself as bound in obeying social and all benefiting rules. But everyone is free in matters pertaining to the individual well-being. Keeping all these points into consideration, the Ara Samaj favored strongly female education and opened a good number of educational institutions for imparting education to girls. The Kanya Mahavidale was opened by Lala Devraj in Jalandhar in 1896. The Kanya Patshala at Dehradun was another school for girls, which was a high school. Besides these two institutions, the Arya Samaj opened Hansraj Mahila Mahavidale in Jalandhar, DAV College for Women in Yamunanagar, and at Amritsar, DAV College for Women and also DV College of Girls College at Batala in Punjab. On July 10, 1907, Sarla Devi wrote a letter to the wife of Roshan Lal of Lahore, in which she had said, if Indian ladies learned to maintain their domestic affairs satisfactorily, they would be all the better equipped to understand the national affairs upon which depend their honor and chastity both during their married life and widowhood. She appealed to the women to be brave like ancient warriors of the sacred Bharat and to discuss matters with their husbands. On October 26, 1907, Mahatma Hansraj, while delivering his lecture in the annual meeting of the Peshawar Ara Samaj, laid stress on female education. The Ara Samaj, particularly of the Punjab, 
started to send out parties of Arya girls from girls' schools on tours round the country with their masters for gaining practical education. One such party under Lala Devraj from the school at Jalandhar went to Kangra on August 31st, 1910. A similar party of 17 girls from the same school under Lala Moolraj went to Hasharpur on September 1 in the same year. The Arya Patra of Bareilly published an article on female education in which it was described that the girls of the country in the ancient time were scholars in Sanskrit. The editor of the magazine advised that Sanskrit should be taught to the Indian girls. The Hindu Education Conference held at Lahore on April 5, 1912 discussed the problem of female education. In the year 1914, the Banaras Arya Samaj popularized the movement in the local areas. Thus, the Arya Samaj made an astonished progress in female education. And this proves that it was not a mere idle talker, but a practical worker in the cause of education. No real uplift of women was possible without radical reform in the marriage system. Most of the disabilities from which women suffered were due to the evils which had crept into the institution of marriage itself. The Hindu marriage custom had many abuses such as polygamy, infant marriage, prohibition of widowry marriage, unequal marriage, heavy dowry, and other ruinous marriage expenses, and restriction of marriage within the narrow circle of subcaste. No real uplift of women was possible without radical reform in the marriage system. Most of the disabilities from which women suffered were due to the evils which had crept into the institution of marriage itself. The Hindu marriage custom had many abuses such as polygamy, infant marriage, prohibition of widowry marriage, unequal marriage, heavy dowry, and other ruinous marriage expenses, and restriction of marriage within the narrow circle of subcaste. The Arya Samaj conducted a fiery crusade against the child marriage and it succeeded in rallying public opinion to favor its view. The Arya Samaj fixed the minimum marriageable age at 16 for girls and at 25 for boys on the principle of the Ved. Swami Dhyanand had classified marriages into three groups, inferior marriages, medium marriages, and superior marriages. Inferior marriages were those between women of 16 and men of 25 years. Medium marriages were those between women of 18 or 20 and men of 25 or 40 years of age. And superior marriages were those between women of 24 and women of 48 years of marriage. The Ara Samaj advocated the very idea of marriage and criticized the infant marriages. Medium marriages were those between women of 18 or 20 and men of 25 or 40 years of age. And superior marriages were those between women of 24 and women of 48 years of marriage. The Ara Samaj advocated the very idea of marriage and criticized the infant marriages. Women branch of the Ara Samaj of Hisar took a leading part in the work of social reform and Purun Devi, who was appointed as a lecturer by the very branch to deliver lectures among women, began to preach against infant marriage. In the year 1911, the Bharat Sri Mandal, All India Ladies Society, started by Sarla Devi, appointed a Bengali lady named Krishna Bhabini Das, impart instruction in the Zananas of Bengal. Another society with which the same lady was connected, the Mahila Milap Sam Samiti, appointed a Bengali lady named Hironmoi Devi to give lessons to married women. Both societies played important role in removing the practice of infant marriage. In its movement against the infant marriage, the Ara Samaj succeeding a lot through, though much still remains, remained to be done. Another society with which the same lady was connected, the Mahila Milap Samiti, appointed a Bengali lady named Hironmoi Devi to give lessons to married women. Both societies played important role in removing the practice of infant marriage. In its movement against the infant marriage, the Ara Samaj succeeding a lot, though much still remains to be done. In the matter of widow remarriage also, the Ara Samaj achieved a great success. 
The question of widow remarriage was taken up by Pandit Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar of Bengal and through his efforts the Widow Remarriage Act was passed in 1856. Then there was no Arasamaj in existence. But that law remained a dead letter for decades till the Arasamajas came into the field and gave a strong impetus to widow remarriage movement. The Arasamaj in this respect left behind all other reform movements of the country and several hundred marriages of child widows took place by its efforts. In March 1990, the remarriage of a Vesha girl, Srimati Parvati, with Lala Kelaram took place under the auspices of the Arya Samaj at Lahore. On May 12, 1901, the remarriage of a Brahmin girl, Srimati Radha Rani, with Lala Shio Lal Visha, an Arya Samajist, was performed in Jhansi. At this very time, the Praja Mandal of Mahua presented a memorandum to the Gekwad on the bill legalizing widow marriage and expressed its opinion that widow remarriage was sanctioned by the Vedas. In 1901, Lala Sarup Lal Agarwal of Muzaffarnagar remarried his daughter to Lala Gobind Prasad. The Arya Samajas attended the marriage ceremony. Though the Orthodox Hindus and the Sanatanists were against widow remarriage and the latter had discussion with the Arya Samajas at Agra, Yet, the Arya Samaj always succeeded in the teeth of many oppositions. Hundreds of widow marriages took place year by year. Two notable marriages took place in the Punjab in 1906. One at Amritsar in the house of a well-known Arya Samajist and another in the house of a well-known Arya gentleman. In the long run, Mrs. Sarla Rai Chaudhrani, General Secretary of the Bharat Sri Mahamandal, waited on Mr. Montag and His Excellency the Viceroy on behalf of a ladies deputation from the Bharat Sri Mahamandal Punjab branch and raised the following points among others. In view of the enforced widowhood of Hindu widows, many of whom are quite destitute and indigent, special institutions should be provided for widow endowed with scholarships for each inmate to make self-supporting members of society and help the government in the supply of female teachers. Special provisions should be made by legislation for protecting the interest of Hindu widows and daughters in matter of inheritance of the property of their husband or father. The interest of the Indian wife should be safeguarded by making it criminal and unlawful for an Indian married man to marry an English woman. Indian women should be allowed to have the right to vote in municipal and other elections. Indian women should be associated in all movements for the furtherance of female education. The control of girls' schools should be made over to the Visiting Committee of Indian Ladies. A strong female Indian agency for inspection should be substituted for non-Indian agency. An Indian Ladies Advisory Council should be formed for matters pertaining to female education. Thus, on this point, the Arya Samaj created a revolution in Hindu society and Hindu widow remarriage lost the horror with which it used to be looked upon 60 or 70 years ago. Thus, during the period from 1876 to 1920, there was all-round improvement in the condition of women. The cumulative effect of all the forces working together was that Parda began to be discarded more and more. People came to realize the importance of female education of one kind or another. Women began to organize their own clubs and get themselves organized in public affairs. And last but not the least, began to appreciate the significance of earning their own livelihood. Thus, during the period from 1876 to 1920, there was all-round improvement in the condition of women. The cumulative effect of all the forces working together was that Parda began to be discarded more and more. People came to realize the importance of female education of one kind or another. Women began to organize their own clubs and get themselves organized in public affairs and last but not the least began to appreciate the significance of earning their own livelihood. What is important to bear in mind is that with the growth of national consciousness there was also an awareness on the part of thinking people that justice must be done to the fairer sex 
and that without progress of women, the general progress of the country was not possible. To these, it is justified to add the philanthropic services rendered by the Ara Samaj. The Ara Samaj was the rival of the Ramakrishna mission in this respect. The Ara Samaj outside the Christian circle was the first purely Indian association to organize orphanages and widows' homes. The first Hindu orphanage was established at Firozpur in the lifetime of Dayanand, which maintained schools and workshops for boys and girls for the purpose of training. There was a network of widow homes at all important centers in the Punjab, UP, Bihar, Bengal and central provinces under the management of Sir Gangaram Trust. In 1909, Radha Krishnan, the editor of the Prakash, demanded right for widows and appealed to the people to open homes for them. The reform in Punjab. Unlike the Brahmo Samaj, the Pratha Samaj and the reform movements of the same genre, which had arisen in strength in Bengal, Bombay and Madras in the beginning and the middle of the 19th century. The Arya Samaj entered late into the picture and was the only reform movement to make spectacular gains in the 1880s and the 1890s. This was the period when nationalist sentiments coupled with revivalist feelings were gaining ground. The tide was against reformers who were attacked both for their alien models and what was considered a misconstructed sense of priorities. The success of the Arya Samaj during this period has to be understood both in the context of its ideological orientations and the social situation of Punjab where it received the widest response. If Western notions of rationality and of a universal man were core ideas overtly manifest in women's reform in Bengal, it was not entirely absent from the Arya Samaj discourses either. But the tenor was definitely more tuned to glorifying the purity of ancient Hinduism. Models for women's reform were however greatly influenced by those same set of Victorian ideas of Puritanism, of improvement, of morality and the role of a good woman in shaping families and propping civilized societies. Nowhere does this model appear more clearly than in the debates on women's education. Discussions on widow remarriage too are strikingly similar to that of the presidencies of Bengal, Bombay and Madras. Importance was given to women's education and widow remarriage which were two of the central issues, women's issues of the dominant 19th century reform movement. The Arasama discourses on both issues reveal its attempt to chalk out a trajectory of modernization of women which stayed clear of the ideas of Western models. The Sambhaj combined a sharp criticism of many existing Hindu practices, idol worship, polytheism, child marriage, the taboos on widow remarriage and foreign travel, Brahmin predominance and the multiplicity of caste based on birth alone, with an extremely aggressive assertion of the superiority of a purified Hinduism above all other faiths. A recapitulation of some features of the late 19th century Punjab is necessary to understand the forces responsible for the Arya Samaj focus on women's reform. The specific goals of the social reformers were absorbed into a dominantly pan-Hindu revivalist framework, a phenomena which was rapidly overtaking the earlier social reform attempts as a central tendency. In Punjab, in 1881, 24.8% of women over 15 years of age in all communities were widows. The figure for Hindus and Sikhs was 25.8%. In 1901, 1,363 out of every 10,000 females of all ages in Punjab were widows, as against 623 widowers per 10,000 men. 
This phenomenon of child widowhood and ban on widow remarriage was almost exclusively confined to certain upper caste and classes. The 1901 census observes, the higher their caste and social position, the lower is the age of betrothal and marriage. To the reformers, the dangerous repercussions of the oppressive institution of compulsory widowhood seemed uncomfortably apparent. The famine of 1896-97 further aggravated the plight of these widows and this was commented upon by the 1901 Punjab census. During the famine years, reports of the sale of women and children, Rabare Hind of 19 November 1896 sounded the alarm by reporting the missionaries had purchased some Indian children for five annas each for the purpose of conversion. Sirajul Akbar of December 1896 reported that people had been reduced to such states in the famine that parents were beginning to sell girls to the missionary lady for one share of oats per child. The Punjab Samachar from Lahore of 9th January 1897 concluded that the prevalence of the famine on the one hand and the poverty of the people on the other hand are helping the missionaries in their work and if this state of things continue, all indigent people will embrace Christianity before long. The institution of child marriage also made education initially impossible for upper caste women. In a fast changing world, parda and illiteracy ensured the virtual isolation of these women from the reality of their husbands and sons who were adapting to the demands of colonial structures. Thus, the institution of the family was experiencing new stress. One way of absorbing the stream was to expose women to a feminine version of the education that men were receiving. This model was no different from that projected by reformers in the presidency area. Education for women and marriage reforms. The RS Samaj realized the significance of education for women and were keen to change the role of the Hindu women. Almost all the writers within the Samaj recognized the need to change the status and role of women and with this educate girls in some manner, but exactly how remained open to considerable debate. Girls' education remained limited in scope and in most cases they were taught a limited curriculum in Hindi and besides reading and ciphering, the girls were taught useful acts of sewing and knitting. The question of higher education for women divided the reformers sharply. In 1984, a series of letters appeared in the Tribune arguing the merits of primary versus high school for girls. Lala Lajpat Rai began the debate by questioning the invisibility of female education. I maintained and do still, he said, that the spread of education among males and some strong and important inducements to back it while the education of girls cannot necessarily derive any support from the same motives of education. He wanted education for girls to be confined to primary education. Lala Lalchand joined Lajpat in calling for caution in continued broadening of primary education. A curious instance of pragmatism and religiosity marked the Swami's perception. He was opposed to co-education and wanted the schools of boys and girls to be situated at a distance. In the earlier years, one of his practices had been not to admit women to his lectures until some women at one meeting in Punjab forced their entrance. A separate accommodation was then provided for them, whereupon the women were urged to look on their husbands as their gurus, while men were asked to give sufficient thought to the welfare of their women. When the RS Samajas took up the cause of female education, it was primarily prompted by the felt needs of the upper caste. Financial support came from the commercial and trading classes. The curricula in Samaj schools cater to the perceptions of men regarding education required by women of their caste and class. Study of religious and domestic economy together with general education was emphasized. The course was not intended towards employment but towards the making of modernized educated housewives. Efforts of the RS Samaj made people view education as respectable. Certain levels of education became a desired qualification in the middle class marriage market. With this, attendance at government schools began to alter in terms of caste and class composition. The content of education in these schools also saw a change along the lines laid down by the Samaj schools. 
the education department encouraged this trend and lower caste girls were channelized into mission schools set up specially for the low caste students. These schools, as the education reports show, came into existence around the turn of the century. The RSMRs played a crucial role in bringing about this in caste and class base of women's education, linked to a corresponding shift in its content. The RSMRs' attempts at marriage reform were directed at both widow remarriage and simplified marriage customs and ceremonies. Swami Dhyanand interpreted the rishis as disapproving of second or third marriages on the death of the husbands and the wives. In following the spirit of the ancient lawgivers, he was strongly opposed to child marriages and declared 16 as the minimum marriage age for girls and 25 for boys. Lashmit Rai emphasized the fact that Dhanan did not lay down any rule for women which he did not apply to men. He exhorted the non-Brahmin castes not to engage any Brahmin priest to conduct their marriage which he sought to reduce to a very simple procedure. So students, let us now summarize what we have learnt in this module. From the 30s of the 19th century in India and in Punjab, different socio-religious reform movements came into being in three different communities, that is Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims. Dayanand Saraswati, the founder of the Arya Samaj, came from Kathiawar, but the Samaj acquired their principal base in northern India, Punjab and parts of western UP. The major concerns of the Arya Samaj were based on equality of the sexes, absolute justice and fair play between men and women and equal opportunities for all according to their nature, karma and merit. The Arya Samaj made an astonished progress in female education and this proves that it was not a mere idle talker but a practical worker in the cause of education. The Arya Samaj fixed the minimum marriageable age for men and women. It criticized the infant marriages which were taking place in India to a large extent. In the matter of widow remarriage also, the Arya Samaj achieved a great success. The Arya Samaj attempt at marriage reforms were directed at both widow remarriage and simplified marriage ceremonies. Swami Dhanan interpreted the rishis as disapproving of second or third marriages on the death of husbands and wives. Thank you.